All right, thank you guys for coming tonight. It's 7 o'clock, time to get going so we can get you out by 8 o'clock. Um, my name is Sandy Golding. I'm president of Beaches Watch. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Beaches Watch, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan civic organization. We have been around for 11 years now. And our focus is educating and engaging citizens in the issues that are affecting our beaches communities. We hold these meetings the first Wednesday of every month, but because uh, our speakers tonight were not available the first Wednesday in June, we moved it back to tonight, so we're so glad to see a good turnout tonight. And um, we do these meetings to, about topics of interest to people so that we can uh, keep people informed and and hopefully citizens can get involved and, and communicate with our elected officials and let our elected officials know um, what they want and what's important to our communities. So before we get started, let me recognize some of the elected officials that we have here tonight. Of course, our speakers, we have uh, Mayor Charlie Latham from Jacksonville. <laughs> number is for that particular stop 
and it will text you back the ETA of the next trolley so that you can know, oh, you know, I don't want to stay out here, I'm going to go back home for a bit, or it's about to be right here. And you can also, once you know the number for your particular stop, you can get home and know when to walk down there. It's $1.50, super AC, super cold, the drivers are super nice, and it's just a really great way to get around. So, ride the trolley. Um, then we also have, oh, we don't have the date on here. Wednesday, July 1st is our next meeting. Um, so, sorry, the date didn't get on the agenda, but it is Wednesday, July 1st, and we are working on the program for that meeting. Um, it's tentatively scheduled to be a program about the Jacksonville Beach Pier because there's been a lot of uh, questions and concerns about the state of the pier and funding and what's going to happen and some things that need to be done. So we're working on that. So that should be a good program. We hope to plan to come to that meeting as well. Um, let me recognize the Beaches Watch board members that are here tonight too, just, um, just so you guys know. We have Eileen Krimsky, who is our membership chair. Um, so if you aren't a member of Beaches Watch, but you would like to support what we're doing, it's only $10 for an individual or $15 for a family. Just helps to put some money in our coffers to help us cover some of the things that we do. And Eileen would be the person to talk to. And then we also have Beth, who you heard from earlier, who's our treasurer. And then I'm president of the board. And then we have Andy Patton, who's our secretary on the board. So we really appreciate the service from our board members. And we, if you ever want to be on the board, we are always looking for board members. Maria is a former board member. And she was so inspired by being on the board that she decided to run for Atlantic Beach City Commission. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so anyway. I'd like to go, I'm sorry? That's okay. <laughs> I'm sure George had something really quiet. Yes, right. <laughs> quiet, George. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to go ahead and get started with our program. We have Mayor Charlie Latham and City Manager George Forbes. They both went to Tallahassee this year, so they, uh, last year we did this program and it was great because they talked about the things that are relevant to the beaches. There's lots of stuff that go on in Tallahassee, but Really, they help distill it down to what's important to our beaches, communities, and so I'd like to go ahead and give them the floor. I think, Mayor, you're, you want to be first? I'm first, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. How about a uh, round of applause for Sandy and the board? This is uh, it's always a great pleasure to come and, and talk with you guys, and, and the questions afterwards are always valuable for us as well. So once we're done, feel free to stick around if you have any questions or or comments about what we're going to talk about today. We broke this up into a couple of pieces today, and George and I are going to tag team it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the legislature in general, the process of how the bills are passed, and how we get involved at different stages along the way. And uh, then George is going to talk a little bit about some specific legislation that has some impact on us this year, and then we'll take uh, some time to answer questions that you might have. Uh, you know, a lot of this is from Civics 101, and we all took it at Fletcher Middle School. Uh, but just to remind you, the Florida legislature is not unlike the, pardon the, the graphics problem here. We went from Mac to IBM, or just kind of messed things up a little bit. But just like the federal government, we have three branches of government. The uh, legislative branch, which is composed of the Florida House and Senate. The executive branch, which is the governor's branch. And then the judicial branch, which is the Florida Supreme Court. We also, in the legislative branch, which we're going to talk about today, uh, the Florida Senate has 40 <coughs> senators in it, and the, the House has 120 representatives. Uh, and if you look at the map for the state of Florida for the Senate districts, it's pretty well defined, and you can see in South Florida, it's, it's not uncommon for the House and the Senate districts to be really small because they're so intensely popular. <laughs> but uh, for the House, it's, it's a little harder to to see, but if you think about it, 120 districts uh, on that map, there's a lot to cover. And especially when you get down into the coastal areas of South Florida, um, a little tiny dot, there's a whole lot of people. The, the Florida Senate leadership this year, uh, Senator Gardner is the president of the Senate, pro tem is Senator Richter, uh, majority leader is uh, Senator Galvano, minority leader is Senator Joyner, and the minority leader pro tem is uh, Senator Bainey. And it, it's, it's critical that you understand that these 
people up here have more influence in our state probably than the governor does. Uh, and while you and I sit back and read the paper when we get up on Monday morning and look at what happened in the, the wrap up for last week in the, in the legislature, we're just getting caught up on summaries of what happened. The activity that happens on a day by day basis in Tallahassee is just absolutely staggering. The amount of, of information and discussion, and bills and committees and subcommittees. So it's kind of hard to keep your arms wrapped around it unless you do it uh, pretty regularly. Uh, the House uh, Representative Chris Foley is the speaker. Speaker Pro Tem is Representative Hudson. Majority Leader is Representative Young. Minority Leader is Representative Hafford. And our own Jacksonville uh, Representative Jones is the uh, Minority Leader Pro Tem. <clears throat> Where we really, our, our base relationships, of course, are with the, the uh, elected officials up in our area, particularly the First Coast delegation. A lot of these names are going to be familiar to you. Uh, in the Senate portion of the First Coast delegation, of course, is Senator Aaron Dean and Duval and Nassau counties. We've seen Aaron here a dozen times talking about what's going on in the Senate. Charles Dean, Senator Charles Dean, is a very senior and powerful uh, member of the Senate with Baker, Citrus, Columbia, Dixie, Gilchrist, Lafayette, Levy, Marion, Suwani, and Union. So he's got a big reach. Uh, Travis Hudson's are one of our, if not our newest senator, uh, for Flagler, Putnam, St. John's, and Volusia County. Senator Bradley is Alachua, Bradford, and Clay. And Senator Gibson is our other senator here in the Jacksonville area. Senator Gibson was critical uh, in helping us to obtain some really substantial financial goals over the last couple of years. Uh, senator Bean was helpful as well, but I'll talk a little bit in detail about some of those downstream here. The First Coast delegation on the House side, we've got Representative Porter from Alachua, Baker, Columbia, Hamilton, and Sewanee. Our own Janet Atkins from Duval and Nassau. Blake Ray from Duval County. Reggie Fullwood from Duval County. Mia Jones, uh, Duval County. Jay Fant, a new representative from Duval County. Charles McBurney from Duval County. Cindy Stevenson, a new representative from St. Charles County, who was recently on their uh, county commission. Travis Cummings, Clay Cannon, Charles Van Zandt from Bradford, Clay Putnam and Union, and Paul Renner, also a new representative for Flagler, St. John's, and Volusia. So these guys are the home base team, and these are the people that, when we sit down and look at our legislative goals for the year, uh, these are the, the go-to people for us, so we're on the phone with them pretty regularly. Sandy mentioned that George and I went to Tallahassee this year. Well, we, George has gone every year for a long time, right? And I've gone for the last 18 years. The thing that's interesting and, and beneficial for the city as well as my new employer, uh, I took a job with Waste Management in October as their government affairs guy. So now I'm in Tallahassee pretty much the majority of the session. And you'll learn as we go through the processes how important that can be for us when things pop up in the last minute and they need to have somebody in front of the committee to explain why this is important for residents of Jacksonville Beach. So let's talk a little quickly about how a, an idea becomes a law. Nobody starts singing conjunction junction. My wife didn't want to talk about that. Okay, concerned citizens. Um, you, you, have, you have a suggestion, you have an issue, it's something that's going to be handled at the state level. In our case, we get a hold of Janet Atkins. We tell her what the problem is. George and I have both done this on several occasions, submitted legislation or ideas for legislation to Janet. She'll introduce the bill. It goes into bill drafting. There are people on the staff that are specifically trained and, and, and prepared to document the, the bill the way that it needs to be presented through the different committees. <clears throat> From there it goes to the clerk's office where they review the bill and forward it to the respective speaker. Uh, the speaker re refers the bill to the committee, subcommittee, or house calendar. Speaker, again, leadership, very powerful individual. Uh, this, the committee chair people, which I didn't, couldn't list here because it would take about 20 slides, uh, they're all very powerful people. The chair people can kill a bill just because they don't like it. Uh, I'll give you a real quick example. We had one in uh, uh, Senate Bill 246 this year was the, the seatbelt or uh, texting while driving, trying to convert it from a secondary to a primary offense. Um, we, we lobbied hard for that because, you know, in my industry, we lose between six and eight people a year killed on the side of the road because people are texting aren't paying attention and they go drive off the road and hit a, somebody who's throwing garbage in the truck. 
Uh, same thing for city employees, same thing for police officers. You know, so it's a very big deal. We worked really hard to get it up through the right committees. We got it to pass in all the committees. We testified at all the committees. But there was one committee chair that I won't mention any names that from South Florida that has very strong convictions in individual rights and doesn't want to do anything to impede an individual's rights. And he felt that that crossed the line. So it died just like that. And uh, you know, it's it's unfortunate, but you know, we the people, the government works for us. We don't work for the government, so it's up to us to pay attention and let people know when that happens that we're upset and it wasn't the right decision. From, uh, it gets, once we get out of the committee and subcommittees, it, it could be one committee, it could be six committees. And, and every time it goes through a committee, the committee chair and the committee members will listen to the bill, they'll listen to the, the, the sponsor of the bill, give up, stand up and give a presentation, tell what the issues are. Sometimes they'll open the floor if they want additional testimony about what this, how this impacts a municipality or a certain industry. Uh, and then they can do several things. They can, they can kill the bill in the committee. Uh, they can pass uh, floor amendments or, or amendments to change the bill before it gets passed to another committee. Uh, or they can pass it as, as written. The bill then goes on the House calendar via the Rules and, and Calendar Committee. Uh, it places the bill on a special order calendar to be considered by the House Chamber. And then the House sends it to the, once they approve it, they send it along with their recommendation to the uh, uh, Senate. And there's always in Florida legislature, there's mirrored bills. So that when the House has put one up, they'll be working with the Senator to sponsor a similar bill. And they'll try and match the bills as they go through the process so that by the time they get to the floors, they've got an agreement already pretty much how they want it to, uh, to be written. Uh, the Senate goes through a similar process. Uh, there are less people involved, so it tends to move a little bit quicker. And there's less people on the committee. So if you've got a committee with four people, it takes sometimes X period of time to get through. But if you've got a committee with 16 people, it takes 4X time to get it through. So again, we work really hard. I spend a lot of time with the House of Representatives because that's where a lot of the work has to be done to get the majority of people behind it. And then, of course, once it's uh, passed, it goes to the governor, and the governor has three options. He can sign approval, he can let it approve on its own after a certain period of time. I think it's seven or 14 days. Do you, Georgia, do you know? It's, it escapes me. But uh, I, over a certain period of time, I think it might be 21 days. Yeah, I was say it's more than seven. Yeah. Is it more? Right. I think it's more than seven. Yeah, I yeah. think it's 21 days yeah. that the governor has to either sign it or not sign it. And if he doesn't sign it or veto it, then it becomes law. And then, of course, the third is if he can veto it. Uh, so I'm going to take just a second to introduce a second topic. And that's the Florida TPO. I'm also the beaches representative to the Transportation Planning Organization. And the reason I'm bringing them into play is to show you how these government agencies work together. Uh, the, the TPO is an independent regional transportation agency. Uh, the, the federal law, uh, statutes require municipalities of greater than 50,000 people to have MPOs, municipal uh, planning organizations. Well, here in Jacksonville, many years ago, uh, they devised the TPO. And the transportation planning organization is kind of a combination of several MPOs for a larger region. And all the people down at the bottom, including that good looking guy in the bottom, are all elected officials in Duval County, Clay County, St. John's County, and Nassau County. And then we have two ex officio members, one from Baker County and one from Putnam County. But what's important to understand about the TPO, by the way, this guy in the park, this is uh, District 2 DOT uh, Secretary Greg Evans. Uh, so while we're doing all this discussion about how we're going to make things happen and how we're going to prioritize transportation issues. And we're talking about everything from highways, re renovation to new highways, to new uh, bike and pedestrian traffic. As a matter of fact, uh, Bill Bishop, who's a colleague of mine on the TPO, and I co-sponsored a, uh, a bike ped survey, both here at the beaches and also from the beaches to Riverside, so that we could put a study in place to see how cost effective and safe it would be for us to designate actual bike paths and make it a little bit safer. Anyway, TPO uh, doesn't really talk about drainage a lot, uh, but we talk about other 
primarily transportation-based issues. Well, because Secretary Evans is on the TPO with me, uh, we started talking a little bit about the drainage problem on uh, A1A. Because, of course, you know, we can't manage A1A or Beach Boulevard because they're owned by the state. Uh, so anything we do this or anything we get for assistance has to come from the state. So anybody that's been in Jacksonville Beach for more than 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years knows we've had a real problem flooding on 1st and 2nd Street. Well, with the help of Senator, uh, Secretary Evans and Secretary, then Secretary Prasad and uh, Audrey Gibson and Aaron Bean and Janet Atkins, we were able to go and lobby the governor's office to get $30.2 million to fix our drainage problems here in Jacksonville Beach. And that is a perfect example of how the system can work if you stay connected with the people who are driving the show. And these are the people that drive the show. We do it on a much smaller scale here in Jacksonville Beach when we put our ordinances together and, and pass laws that are, we think, pertinent to the community. Uh, but at this level, it's scary if you're not paying attention to it. So we pay very close attention to what goes on in Tallahassee. And uh, with that, I guess we'll take a few minutes and talk about legislation for this year, and then we'll answer some questions. So, George. session and some bills and how they directly affect us. But when the session starts, um, it, it, when the session starts, I get, I start reading uh, bill summaries and I get about 30 to 40 pages of bill summaries every Friday or Saturday morning. So I spend the weekend reading the bill summaries. So I'm ready Monday morning and every Monday morning at 9 o'clock I've got a meeting by phone uh, with other cities with the League of Cities uh, gentlemen, the representatives and gentlemen that represent us. And so I can find out what's going on that week, what I have to worry about, who I might need to call to try and support or oppose a bill. Now, I don't read every bill. I read the bill summaries. Why don't I read every bill? Some of these bills are hundreds of pages. And so it's just really impossible to follow all this and read every bill. I can only read the summaries. And I take, take it from the League staff to have people in that have read the bills and whether they may be favorable or unfavorable. So it's a huge process of reading all these, getting ready, and then during the week doing what we can. Now, speaking of what we can do, um, how many senators do we have that represent us at the beaches? How many state senators? This is this some participation time now. Come on, don't be shy. Somebody tell me. One. We have one, that's right. How many people in the House do we have that represent us at the beaches? <coughs> You're not that kind of <laughs> <laughs> so, And where are those lists? How many people? How many people? How many people? Beach. There's one troublemaker in every crowd. How many people do we have? How many people do we have in the Senate? In the state? How many state Senate? How many Forty. State Forty. Senate? Forty. Forty. How many people in the House? Hundred and twenty. So we've got a hundred and sixty horsepower car, and we got two horsepower. I'm, I'm not being sarcastic. I mean, we start. You know, we don't start from a huge position of power. But we leverage that power by dealing with the whole Duval County area delegation. That gives us over 20 people. And that gives us some horsepower on all issues where we get favorable agreement among everybody in our delegation. I will tell you this, in the last two years especially, I've been totally shocked, and I mean shocked, by the really positive reception we get from people in the Duval County delegation that don't even represent us. You know, normally you get over years past that, that we don't represent you, so, you know, why are you bothering me? Why are you talking to me? We do not get that at all. We get a tremendously favorable reception from pretty much the entire of all kinds of delegation. That's a real positive mark for us. So, how do we influence the legislature? Lobby. Mike, is that you? Yeah, lobbying. Lobbying? Mm -hmm. or just call your senator or your representative. Call your senator, call your representative. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you know what's going on up there? Yes. I mean, as a citizen, I'm, I'm dead serious. As a citizen, how do you know what's going on? It, it would be impossible. It's not impossible, but it would be difficult. I, I follow the newspaper, what's going on. 
And, but other than that, it, like you said, you get a summary, and you're actively seeking a summary. But, and, and some of the frustrations are, is that, is that uh, my perception is, perception is that, you know, like there was a bill this, sentence, this session from the communication industry, and it was, it had a lot of, a lot of horsepower behind it. And it's because, you know, many members in the industry, they, they don't just lobby during the session, they're not done, they lobby year round. They can also give money to candidates, which I don't have any money to give them. <laughs> and, and so they, and they're lobbying year round. So um, there was a communications bill, uh, which did not pass. And remember that the session ended abruptly, uh, three days before it was done, and that actually killed a lot of bills that might have passed, that might have, I feel, more in our best interest. It also killed some bills when we discussed something that I thought were good ideas. But you have to understand that you know, and I'm, and we're up against, say, the communications industry. You know, they have a they have bill where they wanted to, in some circumstances, to be fair to them, make us pay to remove um, wires they may have on our property and our right of And we didn't think that was a, a fair deal for us. It's not like these big companies don't have any money either. And so, uh, but they had, you know, they had, I understand, 70 lobbyists. That's, that's pretty hard to beat, man. let me tell you. The, the people that are heavy hitters in the legislature, they got a lot of muscle behind them. They, they, can, they can give money to candidates, and they have their own, they, have, they may have an army of lobbyists out there uh, to, to lobby for them. So that makes it very difficult when you're a little city like Jacksonville Beach, or Neptune Beach, or Miami Beach, and you're trying, to, you're trying to really swerve against the current to try and beat these guys sometimes. It can be done, but it's very difficult. The other thing is, and this, this this gets to me a lot. Sometimes people, you know, don't you complain to me like the city of Jack's Beach, you didn't know what was going on, but, you know, we, we are, our process is very slow, you know. To pass an ordinance, we usually have a workshop, the you know, two meetings, which are two weeks apart, and then we can adopt it. In the state legislature, especially at the end of the legislature, they may go to four hours notice before a meeting, or one hour notice before a meeting. They have strike calls whereby they'll take a bill, strike everything in it, and reload a whole new, whole new, whole new bill with it. And I'm supposed to be able to take care of that? You know, there, there are times this session where I'll get a phone call, uh, hey George, read this bill, uh, we've we got to know something about it at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Well, maybe a 200 page water bill. I mean, now, come on guys, you know, that's just, it's, it's almost impossible sometimes to keep up what's, what's going on there. And if it's almost impossible for us, again, we don't, we don't have any full-time staffers on the legislature. It's just a few of us that try and keep up. I've always told the mayor, we do a good job with what we got, which is basically nothing. <laughs> and, sometimes, and sometimes it's like feeling like you're a BB gun with BB gun shooting against tanks. But the last couple of years, we've had, we've had a, a, a small firm called Public Affairs Consultants help us a little bit down there. And the reason for, for that is, is easy. And that's like, when bills are starting to really move and move around, I need some boots on the ground that can physically go to an office and talk to a senator or legislator or their staff members because they're so busy. And you're going to say, why don't you call them? Well, because I, I can try, but I'll never get through. Why don't you email them? Well, they, the, the people in the House, instead of telling me themselves when things get tight, don't buy the emails because we'll have thousands of emails and we'll never get to it in time. So, if we, so we have to have some boots on the ground to try and help us a little bit to get through the session, which we do. But remember, we have two, two one person seven rules in the house, is 160 total, and we don't have an army of lobbyists down there. So that puts us in influence, influence area, puts us way behind the eight ball. Now we do have the League of Cities. We are members of the four League of Cities. They have, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know the exact number, but let's say around 10 people or so, 10 to 12 people working on these different areas of the legislature. And that's, that's helpful. Um, and it does help when we bind together as, as cities, different cities, to try and move legislation. It's helpful. But as far as power brokers, uh, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of very powerful guns out there. And sometimes, so my bottom line is, I feel, I feel as you're saying, we're always at a competitive disadvantage against the, the big boys out there. So let's talk a, so the, let's talk a little bit about some bills here. And uh, first off, I want you to remember, this session, they passed a record low number of bills, which I'm not sure is an all bad thing. But there were 1,500, 1,500 bills filed. Of that, 231 passed today. Now let's not forget the legislature is still in session. Now the resolution of, 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 of this special session said that they could only take up 
uh, budget, obviously, and it's my understanding they can also consider bills that pass the House and pass the Senate and need to go to a conference committee. They can do that. But don't think they can't do anything else because by two thirds vote, they can act on anything they want. I think that's my, the, my, the people I've talked to in Tallahassee say there's very, uh, that's probably not going to happen at all. <coughs> but again, if they get a two thirds vote, they can push through whatever they want. So I guess my point is sometimes I never feel safe until the session is totally over. So let's talk about a few bills here. Hospital, Beaches Baptist Hospital, what does that have to do with anything? Well, you know, when, we're, when we talk about the state, and the number one issue, this whole session has been the budget. I mean, the heck's sake, when's the last time the legislature couldn't agree on a budget? Um, that, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. And they've got to adopt the budget by the end of their fiscal year, so by July, they have to have a budget adopted. And the big issue is the low income pool. The low income pool, as everybody in this room should know, is a pool of funds that's been used for several years to help pay hospitals for low income people that may, maybe don't have insurance and need care. And you know what? We're paying for that one way or the other because if the feds don't pay for it, it just included, it gets included in our bills. Now, Joe Metric always turns red when I ask him how much a band aid costs in the hospital. We know how to pay for that. <laughs> so, I'm not going to bring any of that stuff up. Red would do that too. But, um, but we do have a big problem. The low income pool, pool totals this year $2.17 billion, of which $1.3 billion are federal funds. And the federal government said that they've given the state warning and they're not going to continue to fund that pool at that level of funding, which could mean as much as a billion dollar loss for the state. So I got here tonight um, Phil Boyce. Uh, Phil is the senior vice president of managed care for, for Baptist Health System. <coughs> And the reason I, well, it's very important to talk is I've heard some talk in the state or read that, you know, you know, we're going to go with strict competition and if hospitals fail, so what, you know. And, but it's a real big deal on who's paying the bills, these bills. So, um, Phil, can you stand up for just a few minutes? Why don't you go on down here and just, if you would just, just speak a little bit to this issue because, you know, one thing I want to point out before I turn it over here for you is that we are so lucky to live here. We are so lucky that we have the Baptist Hospital Health System and other very prestigious hospitals in our area that uh, that's one of the reasons it's such a great place to live. So can you just give us for a minute your, your, your take on what's happening in Tallahassee right now? It's a pleasure to be here. I've been with Baptist 20 years in August. And what that means is I've had the privilege of working with Joe Metric for 20 years. So I want you to know you have a first class hospital administrator and the beaches to be <coughs> and a first class person. So it's an honor to work with Joe. Uh, in terms of what's going on with healthcare funding, and, and listening to a previous conversation about what impacts the beach is, what's important to the beach, Beaches Hospital uh, treats maybe 30% in the emergency room Medicaid patients. Uh, not that many admissions. The major adult Medicaid admissions are at Shands UF, and the almost all, 99% of pediatric Medicaid admissions are at Wolfson Children's Hospital, which is part of Baptist. So while Wolfson's is not at the beach, children here would go to Wolfson Children's Hospital and for significant um, services for adult Medicaid patients, uh, most of them go to Shands. So the funding for what we call safety net hospitals, safety net for adult, safety net for children, University of Florida, Shands, UF, they also have the only level one trauma. So if there's a, an accident here, a trauma uh, accident, helicopter's going to come and the patient will be taken to, to UF. So while, again, these facilities are not at the beaches, beaches hospitals here, it's really this whole low income pool funding issue that's been kind of the key uh, dispute and uh, the topic of the special session. It does relate to the beaches community for, for trauma, for uh, pediatric, and for adult in the Medicaid world. Obviously, most children have coverage, but there are some that are not covered. They would go to Wilson um, and uh, University of Florida, Shands, they have a contract with the city. They see many uninsured adults. So those hospitals that are considered safety net hospitals have received funding historically from the federal government, and it's been in the tune of about $2.2 billion for about 30 uh, 
uh, safety net hospitals in the state. Uh, so the two here, Wolfson and UF, but you know other hospitals in the state, Jackson Memorial again in Miami. Um, so it's a really big deal. The, the funding levels of that 2.2 billion historically, um, Jacksonville, Shans UF, uh, they've changed their name recently, so I, I keep calling them Shans, but they go by UF. Um, they receive about 95 million a year. Uh, Wilson Children's Hospital, and actually a little bit for our hospital up in uh, Nassau County, uh, receive about 14 million. So that's kind of the breakdown of the money historically that's come. The change has occurred philosophically with the federal government uh, recently and, and really with the Affordable Care Act. Historically, payments were made to the safety net hospitals to help them make up the shortfall for uninsured and for Medicaid. Medicaid covers about 60% of cost. So there's a shortfall when you treat Medicaid. 60% is better than 0%, but it still doesn't cover cost. So the, the contribution to safety net hospitals is to help make up that shortage of unfunded, and low-funded patient volume that have significant patient volume. Wolfson, about 60% of our patients from Wolfson Children's Hospital are Medicaid. So the, the change in the federal government was from funding for losses hospitals incur for being a safety net to let's provide insurance so that you can go to physicians and, and actually receive care other than the emergency room when you don't have insurance, and, and expanding Medicaid. Medicaid has some limitations. And, uh, it's not just below a poverty level, it's also if you have dependents or you're pregnant, there's certain requirements. So expanding Medicaid would be anybody under a certain federal poverty level, 138%. So the idea of let's expand Medicaid let's also provide coverage in the Affordable Care Act rather than giving money that to support those who are doing the safety net, let's try to cover people and that way they don't have to either receive care in the emergency room, they can get a primary care physician and that's the mentality. So along with that mentality, the federal government said, we're changing it, different kind of policy mindset here, so we're going to scale back on the funding for the safety net hospitals, but we want to cover a lot of people. Well, in this state, when the Supreme Court made their decision that states weren't forced to expand Medicaid, Florida chose not to expand Medicaid. So now you have a situation where the funding is going down for the safety net hospitals, but the Medicaid isn't expanding. So hospitals are now in this you know, tough situation. So this year, um, the, the issue was not 2.2 billion, but 1 billion. So how do you make up for that shortfall? And um, being with different hospital administrators, some safety net hospitals, you know, they may make maybe $2.5 million positive margin for the year. Basically, they're at break even. So any reduction, say, to $95 million, that keeps your doors open is a significant hit and potentially could be catastrophic if you know, 500 bed hospital, uh, that's really the safety net hospital has to close their doors. Trauma, one goes away, the education of physicians there, the, the residency programs stop. I mean, it's catastrophic and there isn't capacity for Baptist, for St. Vincent's, for HCA, Mayo, Memorial, all the other hospitals. There just isn't capacity to absorb 500 patients that are at UF every day. So it's pretty, it's a serious issue. What, um, so the, the expansion of Medicaid was the big issue, the Senate was for it, trying to do it in some, some form or fashion. Um, so that did not pass. So in the special session, Medicaid is not gonna be expanded and that was voted on, so that's the way it is. But what do we do about the shortfall? So the House, agreed to put forth 400 plus million dollars. So there's 1.1 coming from the federal government. There's now another four and change coming from the Florida House or the Florida legislature. 
Yeah, so what, what they're going to be able to do is send up that almost $500 million, and it's kind of complicated, I'll explain it, but they can send that $500 million or almost $500 million up to the federal government and get a match, and so uh, another $600 million or close to it will come back down to the state. So there's the opportunity, kind of the bottom line here, this year, an opportunity to get most of that $2.2 mil billion uh, for this year, which pretty much kicks the can down the road one more year. How that money is going to be allocated hasn't been determined. We at Baptist are very supportive of making sure that UF receives all the funding they received last year because it's such a critical hospital to the community. Next year, that billion dollars from the federal government is only going to be $600 million. So we're going to be right back in a situation of underfunding. But I guess the good news is from this um, special session, which is still going on, is the funding um, is pretty close to what it's been. And if it's allocated fairly to the safety net hospitals, it will be one more year that we'll kind of survive and we'll be back at it. So, thank you. Thank you very much. So, who can tell me what Amendment 1 was? Amendment 1 passed by 75% of the voters of the Board of Conservation. Council Land Conservation. Land Conservation. Absolutely right. Well, that actually is very important to the beaches communities because in Jackson Beach, we had the Credit Creek Preserve. We bought that land and developed that land into a preserve based on similar type monies. Um, It's beautiful. You've got Dutton Island and Atlantic Beach, and what, what you, you've got another another uh, conservation besides Dutton Island. Or what's it called? We have River Branch Preserve and Tidings. Right. Yeah. So we've got all those. So, you know, God's not making any more land in Jacksonville Beach. Uh, this was environmentally sensitive land. A developer was going to come in and build. He thought he was going to build 35 homes or so. We thought he was going to build 25 homes or so. But anyway, we never got into that dispute because we were able to voluntarily purchase land from and build a preserve. Would not have happened without we got some of these from this from uh, John Delaney and the Better Jackson plan at the time. We got uh, monies, we got grant monies uh, from the state and from uh, land for a preservation trust. I may be using the wrong words there to go ahead and, and get this. So. Guys, I'm making more land. There's $750 million that's available right now uh, for these projects. And the state, in the regular session, didn't had disagreements on this also, on how to spend this money. There's been some disputes, too, on whether the legislature is trying to spend, going to try and spend it in a manner that's spelled out in the bill. There's disagreements. We, we cannot, you and I, we'll talk about this later tonight. We can read things in the bill. We may all think it's real simple and clean, but when it gets down to the politics of it all and the regulations and everything by the time it's through, we may not all agree with that. So this is a big deal. This also needs to be cited on the legislative session. How to spend the, uh, the amendment fund money for con land conservation, and whether it's really going to be spent on purchasing land for conservation, or whether it's going to be spent in other areas. In some respects, this is kind of getting tied into the water issues, too. This may surprise you, but probably the biggest issue, not just in Florida, but the United States, is going to be water in the future. You know, uh, Water's a big deal. I spent 10 years as a city manager in the desert, and I can tell you, in Florida, we sort of really don't have a water problem because you've always got the ocean. If you're in the desert and you don't have any water, you really don't have any water. <laughs> you know, there's no pipe to go to. There. So my point on you is, so, you know, water is water to drink, drinking water. We take it all for granted, drinking water. Here, nobody thinks about it. But in most of the world, that's a really big deal. And the amount of deaths due to, to uh, hygiene and lack of potable water is, is a big thing. So but we need to worry about that in Florida because as we're sucking the reservoir, you know, the, the underground Florida aquifer, you know, as we're sucking that dry and dry, we're gonna have to find, we're gonna have to conserve better, we're gonna have to find other water sources, and whether it's we go to the ocean and build reverse osmos plants or whatever, um, we're gonna have to really watch how we use our water in the state of Florida. We're also destroying some of our critical springs by by pollution in other areas. So there's a huge movement. What I don't really sometimes understand is we all we all live here. Why do, we, why, do we, why, do we, why do we live in Florida? 
because it's such a gosh darn beautiful state. And the waterways in our cities, they're all part of why life makes it so beautiful. So if we destroy our waterways and we destroy what we came to live here for, then nobody's going to come here. So I think not only water to drink, but our water quality of our rivers and streams is critical to why life and why people we were here in the first place. So it's something we're looking at. There was a big water bill, I didn't put it on here. It was like hundreds of pages long. No, I didn't read it, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> it was on it didn't pass, but again, it's going to have to come up next year because it's a critical, critical issue for all of us. What's this for? Well, this is labor negotiations with the police department. <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way, but actually, I'm very proud of Jackson Beach's police fire and general meetings. We were able about a year ago to all agree on pension reform. And the city's pension plans are all in good shape fiscally, uh, and that's really all due to the efforts. But the big deal about our pension reform is that it was done without having to go to arbitration. It simply means that both sides were able to agree to a contract. It wasn't easy, but we were able to do that. Well, there's been a big issue growing though for the last 20 years, and let me try and explain it. Um, we get monies, both our this just applies to police and fire. Both our police and fire pension funds get money from the insurance policies that you take out of the beaches. For instance, for every property insurance policy, about 1.85% of that goes to, into a fund we call 175 monies, special fund to pay for fire and fire pensions. And about 8.085 money when we pay our casualty insurance goes into a special fund that helps pay for the police pensions. And it's not chump change. We get about 440000 a year to help pay for police and fire pensions. The problem really started in 1999. In 1999, the legislature passed a bill, and it said, and again, these are com complex issues, but the, the, the real basic issue was they said, generally, we had to spend that money in, in, uh, for, for additional benefits for police and fire. Now, remember, these monies were initially set up because there were no pensions for police and fire, and so they, and this is a way to start funding pensions. But over the years, 1999 bill passed, it said, again, generally you had to spend these monies just for, just for ways that the pensions exceeded what you paid or general employees. Extra benefits that exceed what you pay or general employees. Well, this has been an issue of debate of exactly what that means, interpretations back and forth since 1999. It's sort of been a little back, skirmish battle year after year after year. And this bill that was passed uh, is, is tended to settle. And I'm disappointed in the bill that passed. It's not the one that I wanted because it's, it's so complex that I really don't understand it. It's about 40 pages. Um, it's a bill to pay. The good news about the bill is it says that if this place, in a, let's just say, the place of fire, the cities agree to something, mutually agree to something, we can pretty much spend that money any pension way we want. But it says if we don't agree on how to spend it, there's a very convoluted process, and I've explained to you by you how, that says that, that some of that money goes to the city and some of that money has to be spent for, like a lot of, as I believe, something like a 457k monies for firefighters, there's a, the policemen. There's another bill that we wanted to pass, that didn't pass, that, that was very simple. It said that you get this money, half has to, half can, if you can't mutually agree, half goes to the city to help pay down the unemployment liability, and half goes to the police and firefighters and they can use it for a uh, for, for 457k type defined uh, contribution plan. But that one didn't pass. A simple one didn't pass. A complicated one passed. Uh, it's a whole big issue of what the cities want, what the unions want, what the, some of the egos, frankly, are within the state legislature. And the one that passed is one that we took in the morning. Now, this bill is complicated enough that there's going to have to be training sessions on it for, for this year. Um, but, you know, the good news is I'm hopeful that the bill uh, works out well for both of us, and I'm hopeful that it it ends these, these battles we've had since 1999 and not any money, so stay tuned. Oh, Sandy, I'm so glad you're here. Um, <coughs> this, uh, they, they passed a bill that um, had some additional causes of action for the Barrett Park Harris Law. Now, this has tremendous implications for Jackson Beach because this is something I've talked to Sandy about for years. <laughs> and, and she's never quite believed me, I don't think. But anyway, uh, let me just read you what the Bert Harris says. Just, it's a very, you know, this act is very long, but I'm just going to read you one, or one couple sentences from it. The Bert Harris Act says that when a specific action of a governmental entity, that would be you, Charlie, uh, 
has inordinately burdened, those are key words, inordinately burdened an existing use of real property or a vested right to a specific use of property, the property owner of that real property is entitled to relief, which may include compensation for the actual loss in fair market value of the property caused by the action of government. So that's a major. So when the 35 foot height limit passed, you know, we have, you know, I think somewhere between the 20 of those causes of action against us. And this one, by the way, even to my surprise, is still going. You know, this picture here is on First Street, uh, First Street in Jacksonville Beach. It's um, and it uh, is in 1316 First Street North, and it's called Las Olas. And you know, some of these I think are dead. You know, because I haven't heard on this, I haven't heard about this for probably five years. But we recently got a, a, a judgment and an order from the judge that said this property can go to 60 foot high. So we're still that by the way, that order isn't final yet. The city, I believe, is going to be doing some appealing on that. But still, um, still when we talk about these things, if I read you, when I read you that sentence, it probably seems to make sense. But when you put it in the when you put it in real life action, it gets very complicated. You get all the lawyers involved and the judges and heaven knows what comes out in the end. Um, so I don't you know, actually I'd tell you a lot more if it wasn't being videotaped. <laughs> <laughs> Court action. I think I just said about all I want to say. But my point only is that some of these things sound real simple and really put them into action and get pretty complicated and convoluted. So, with that, what this new bill did is it said that uh, it's actually the new bill was based, the, the state legislature jumped right in because they loved there was a United States Supreme Court case just in the past couple of years. And it was based on St. John's County. And St. John's County, let me just read this. So this is a new cause of action in the Bird Harris case. It says that if we pass legislation that, uh, that to extract something from somebody's property, and let me just read this to make sense. It's condition imposed by a governmental entity on a property owner's proposed use of real property that lacks an essential nexus to a legitimate public purpose and is not roughly proportionate to the harm the governmental entity seeks to avoid. Can I, I, I buy that. Actually, sounds good to me. I mean, it was sincere, but when you put it in, our concern was at least we're opposed to it. So when you put it in action, we don't really know what that means. And so our real concern, anything with Bert Harris tends to get us a little bit on the edge because you know the type of lawsuits that we really don't want to see in the future. So, uh, so anyway, that bill, that's a bill that passed, and we didn't, that we didn't care much for you. Then another one that I know uh, addresses all of our, our communities is. Uh, Sober homes. Now we do have sober homes uh, throughout Jackson Beach. I don't know. Maria Marks Mary may have some problems in Lake Beach with sober homes, those type of facilities. Not yet, not yet. But yeah, we're watching. We do, we do. And uh, basically this is important because uh, they they instead the state did a good thing. We agree with this. They established a voluntary certification program for sober homes. You know, voluntary, big deal. Well, it is a big deal, I'll explain you why. Now, one, the certification program requires training of staff and it requires background screening. And the, 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 and the teeth to this is, it says the bill prohibits licensed treatment facilities from referring patients to non-certified sober homes. So licensed treatment facilities can't refer somebody to a non-licensed to a non-licensed sober home when it doesn't meet these qualifications, voluntary qualifications. So that's not a you know, that's not a slam dunk. It doesn't mean what's a sober home. Pardon me? Like what is a sober home? Sober home is a home established for, say, uh, people with alcohol problems, uh, to give them a place where they can still go to work and live and, and, um, and go back and forth. The problem, John, is, is that um, the problem is that the people in these homes sometimes create problems for their neighbors and other people in the neighborhood. Um, we're finding that in Jackson Beach on more than one occasion. You know, on a space of sober home, but if you got a sober home, let's just say there are four people living in it and they, they're, they're recovering alcoholics, to, to have an example. Um, and if nobody knows the difference, who cares? Do you know what I'm trying to say? So work in theory, who cares? But it, that's really not how it's working out in many cases, at least in Jackson and across the state of Florida. But, so that's, what, that's why this bill, I think, is important. It's a good step in the right direction, and we'll see, we'll see what happens. Can I ask a question about, on this sober home? Is there some new regulations in Jackson Beach that permits that in certain areas, or is that just everywhere? Well, 
there, there's, there's some other state and federal laws that they, they can potentially kick in effect here, but um, basically, I, I, basically, I'm not sure whether we really allow everywhere, but I do know they are allowed. If, if you if you have like four people less, they are allowed to single family residential homes. The key is how many people are in But then again, many times I'm not being I'm not trying to be funny. Many times we come to the house and knock on doors and say, "How many people live here?" It's not like they always give us the right number. <laughs> so it's hard. To, it's hard sometimes to enforce. It's hard to figure out exactly how many people sometimes are living there. So another one. Skate parks. Um, this is pretty important. Land Beach has a beautiful uh, and I think a very high level skate park. Jackson Beach is considering building a skate park in South Beach Park. Don't get mad at it. It's not the right thing we're seeing up there. It's just off the internet. We're considering building a skate park, park in South Beach Park. This is important because in the, the, what, what had been the case is for public skate parks, if somebody under 17 used them, uh, in order for the government to maintain a certain limit on liability, they had to have a note from their parents that they could use that skate park. They also, they also required more helmet. And what this bill did is it lifted that requirement and said, yeah, it's very difficult to enforce. I don't know how to name each other, but it's very difficult to enforce. But this says that we're not required, we have a public skate park, we're not required to have permission from the parents to let somebody under 17 use a skate park. You could drive at 16, for heaven's sake. So you have to at 15, right? So I don't know. They, you know, they say it's weird for those of us, everybody in here, most of you, not all of you, kind of my age ish. And it's kind of remember, we're, we're kids, we remember, like, ah, I'm going to get a license when we're 13, you know, let me drive a car. Today they just use skateboards, I guess. You know, uh, so it's a little bit different mindset today. <clears throat> so, where were you planning on putting that in South Beach Park? We're planning on putting it in the general area of, of where that pond is. We don't need that pond for stormwater purposes. So we're planning on converting that pond into a into a, a skate bowl, a shallow skate bowl. Um, and it's not anything as large as this. this is. <laughs> um, ooh, okay. A few weeks ago, I was in New York City, landed at LaGuardia Airport. You know, like anybody else, you know, walking down here, walk outside to get a get a uh, van or whatever to, to my hotel. Guy says, "Hey, where you going?" That's not that's not a usual hotel for somebody out there thinking where you go. Told him the hotel I was going to, and he said, none of these none of these uh, bands will take you there. But I'll take you there. It's only sixty five dollars. I'll take you there. Great. But I thought it was a little weird because I wouldn't just stay at the door where the taxis and everything was. He walks me down to the end of the block, and wow, what pulls up by the Cadillac? S what do you have to say? S Escalade. 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 What's up? Guy jumps out. The guy who walked me over there jumps in. We get in, boom, we take off. This, listen, I, I just wrote recently, a few months ago, I wrote in the cab in Washington, D.C., and the dashboard of the cab was a garbage can. I thought, I mean, it was just like the filthiest thing I've ever been in my life. Um, this thing was pristine. I mean, it was, not only was it wax beautiful, with the interior, they even had bottles of water before us. <laughs> bottles, have you ever heard of that in the cab, bottles of water? So I went to them on a little bit night of yes, I uh, what cab company is this? Because <laughs> there's not no, no markings on him in that door. Here. The guy said, <laughs> the guy said, well, I'm, so I'm, I'm Uber cab company. And I said, oh, how are you guys getting along with the cab drivers? Because, you know, New York City, to get a medallion to operate a cab has been costing over a million dollars. I recently read, because of Uber and some of these others, that they're selling for like 880000 something like that. Dollars. My point is, it's a big problem. And, and then with technology is the laws have got to catch up with technology. So anyway, uh, to make a long story short, I think with what what the way the guy very cleverly did and what he did to get my business, I don't think they're allowed to pick up at the airport. Um, I think what he did, and there was no identification on the guy, no nothing, nothing on the vehicle. I think what he did he was, he was obviously trolling for business because I don't think they're allowed. If they were allowed, they were just pulled up like like anything else. So I don't think they're allowed to have business. So anyway, um, but I do highly recommend it if you're in the <laughs> So anyway, what, what, I'm, what I'm on now is bills that fail. So let's get this bill fail. And these are things I hope come up because they need to be addressed. This bill failed. They had a bill in the state legislature that established a statewide regulatory scheme that included insurance coverage standards, disclosure requirements, anti-discrimination policies, and two levels of background checks for drivers of, of 
we go around doing this all the time. I think it's a great idea. The problem is, of course, that needs to be resolved is how do you deal with the cab companies? Now, this bill also said municipalities can't regulate these kind of companies at all. And I'm not opposed to statewide regulation, and maybe what in the long run is the best way to handle this. However, what do you do with the local cab companies that are required by Jacksonville to get, you know, to get the Jacksonville medallions? Now, Jack's Beach, we used to regulate taxi cabs. We believe it was a bad idea. We did it for many years. So years ago, the city council and myself, we, we gave that up. We, we still require cabs to get an idea business tax law license, but as long as they have a day from Jacksonville, we, we accept that. We don't make them jump through any hoops. So I don't, I don't know how this needs to be resolved. Again, the technology has got it. The laws have to keep up with the technology. Uber's here to stay. I love the one trip I had in it. And, uh, and so we, need to, we do need some state legislation. We don't have it yet. This didn't pass. But I think it's important that they do. Another thing that's really important is the homeless situation. I can tell you right now, the homeless situation, some of you may disagree with me, but I am downtown and, and in the uh, downtown area of Jackson Beach, even the city work here, almost seven days a week. And I can tell you, it's the best I have ever seen it. I've been here 20 years. It's the best I've ever seen it. And I guess, you know, we're never going to wipe out homelessness. But it's a, it's a really good level. I, a lot of credit for that, to, I think, goes to the Mission House. Uh, they've done a great job of getting people into hot temporary housing. Obviously, the Sells Locker Center is important. We have a police uh, team that Chief Thomason helped establish with the whole team. They give them cards. You know, the police officers aren't just there trying, you know, trying to arrest people. They give them hope cards. They ask if they need help. They show them where they can get help. And I think that's been critical, too. So the homeless situation is as good as it's ever been. But there was a bill, again, that didn't pass. That were dedicated 4% from the local government housing trust to be used for homelessness issues. I think that was a good bill and a good idea. So, again, it did not pass. I hope it comes up again at the next session because we do need to have a, a, level, a level standard to help, uh, to help people who want to get on their feet get on their feet. We can't, with not all homeless people want to be on their feet. We have what we call lifestyle homeless people, they don't want to be helped. And, and I, but what I like so much about the Mission House and the and the sales person, they understand that too, that there are some people who just don't want to be helped. And we can't help somebody unless they want to help themselves. So this next one, this kind of puts me in a difficult situation because uh, this is Chuck in his backyard. <laughs> <laughs> We can't regulate, basically we can't regulate, you know, shooting weapons in our city limits, period. It's, it's all part of the state. As a matter of fact, this is the only bill I have seen in my career that said, because it wasn't that many years ago, sometimes five years ago. This bill says also, as I recall, that if I tell somebody that, uh, if, I, if we make a law, right, we tell somebody that they can't shoot a weapon or something, and, and I go to court and I'm wrong, that I can't, I personally can be sued personally, and I can't even say that I use advice as my attorney for defense. And I've never ever seen that in any bill in my life except this one. But I can't even use, I consult with my attorney's defense. So that's why Charlie's still got this in his backyard. <laughs> we are having problems throughout the state. Of state. People you know, have arrangements in their backyard. Mine has a picture of George on it, so. <laughs> <laughs> would have said, and I think it's a good idea, is that um, the law enforcement officer can charge somebody with the first degree misdemeanor if a person regularly discharges a firearm outdoors in a residential neighborhood with a density of one or more dwelling units per acre. So anyway, if it's not a very dense area, you can shoot them in the backyard, whatever. If it's in a, in a dense area, which pretty much all of Jackson Beach, you can. Now, to say kind of a joke on this, the only thing Charlie and I get a lot of flack over in Jackson Beach is the duck hunters. The duck hunters are out there certain times of year, and early in the morning, I hear them. Oh, Mrs. Shields hears them too. And you hear the big beast the firecrackers going off, bang, bang, bang. It's the duck hunters. And we've gotten a lot of flack about that. We've told things, look, it's duck hunting season. Nothing we can do about it. Call game fish and wildlife. You know, we, we, there's nothing we can do about that. But I do think that some, but I hope that we can kind of some regulation on this at some point in the past. Then we've also had a problem. Not so much yet in, uh, in, in Jack's Beach, but it's been more of a problem in Neptune Beach and Atlanta Beach. Let me give you another example. My daughter and my son-in-law went with us to New York. And being older folks, my wife and I, we stay in a hotel. 
Well, my daughter and her husband, being much younger, they get online and they find a condo in Manhattan that they could rent for one night. And so they did. Now, the good news is it was a very nice condo, very sparsely furnished, though. The bad news is, and I'm, I'm warning all you, in case you try, especially younger people, you try this out, but watch, be careful with this, is what they did find out that when they took their showers in the morning, there were no towels. No. <laughs> so, watch what's in them. Um, that's, that's actually a true story. I personally gave a chart. <laughs> so, vacation rentals, the state took that, took that away from us, too. Um, they said that we can't regulate uh, vacation rentals in a number of days, basically. That you can stay in a, uh, uh, that someone can, can rent to sit in their homes. It, it's, uh, again, it's, everything's a blur to me time to time. I was within the last five years now. They also did, though, they grandfathered in existing cities. Existing cities that had regulations on uh, vacation rentals, they grandfathered in. But there was a bill this year that, that tried to get through that did not pass again. Just like the backyard gun ranges that said that um, it would have, the bills would have allowed local governments to set minimum stay level requirements for properties up to seven days. So, in other words, they said local government could say that if you rent your uh, condo, that's fine, it's got to be at least seven days. Well, that didn't pass either. Again, I think that's the reason I'm bringing these up. These are a lot of issues that affect neighborhoods and affect people. And, uh, and again, in, in most of these cases, when we talk about the gun ranges, vacation rentals, um, these are things that, um, that, that any authority regulated be taken away from us by the state. So, um, I had one other quick thing here. Uh, maybe I passed the slide, maybe I didn't. Uh, must have passed it. But there was another bill, it was kind of, it was kind of, I thought it was kind of a silly one that said that if a school tells the city that uh, there's a, a hazard on the sidewalk, a broken sidewalk or something, that we have to repair it or report back to the school, you know. Why we can't repair it? Well, to be honest with you, any local government would be kind of idiotic not to repair a broken sidewalk to the school that may be a hazard for a kid. So uh, that, was, that was kind of silly. So this is kind of what I really try to do is kind of tie together how some of these can affect us or not affect us. One of the problems I always have at the end of the session after reading, you know, hundreds of bill summaries during the session. By the time the session ends, there's times, honestly, I can't remember which one's passed or didn't pass. So I have to go back and really refresh my memory, especially this session when so much died at the very end of the session. I honestly think that uh, probably ending the session later again probably helped, helped us more than hurt us. But then again, a lot of these huge issues, like when I talked about the communications industry, they're just going to be right back at it next year and, 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 and things will be new. I'm not, I'm not real positive on how successful we on some of those issues. So, with that, it wasn't, you know, in some respects, it wasn't a real exciting session. Last year, I think we had a lot more exciting issues. We had the, the you know, this year, this, a little bit earlier, we talked about the trial. We remember this group, uh, groups of people in this room did a fabulous job of, you know, uh, of saving the ferry. And, and now we've kind of resurrected trying to make, trying to make the, the trial and throughout the beaches better and better, too. So, with that, uh, does anybody have any questions? But my question. Yeah, uh, you brought up a very good point that these bills that influence us at the beach, it's hard for citizens to keep track of them. Perhaps the city could put on their website or something, something that has to do with either Jacksonville Beach or the beaches in general that is coming up so that we can contact our legislator and, and put a little, I mean, I'm trying to help. No, and that's a great idea. And sometimes that can work. We have time. We don't have time. We have time. Yeah. Well, I, I don't mean my time. I mean just how fast. That's what I'm saying. You may. Yeah. What might be a good idea is to uh, focus on the things and, and us call attention where we can help. Yeah. 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 Tweet it whatever way you want. But summary of the bills. I mean, there are 10, 15 pages there. That's what I'm saying. I mean, just that's oh no, just just a brief. Well, that's the summary. Oh. 15 pages. Yeah, well, then you're going to have to have a long <laughs> see this website. Go ahead. Are the bill summaries publicly available online on somewhere other than the city? Yes. Where the the Senate and House both can go in there and enter by <coughs> number or by number and tell you where the bill is, the language, who the committees are, what they're going through. Uh, Mr. I was just going to ask about the vacation rental uh, bill that uh, so, for example, if you own a house and you wanted to rent that house, you can now rent it for one day or two days or whatever. There's a to the best of my understanding, there, there's not today because the state legislature 
again, sometime, I think it was within the last five years, it all, it all becomes a blur a little bit, but sometime in the last five years, they took, all, they took uh, our ability to regulate that away from us. So today, that's not against, that's not against law, unless, again, I think Neptune Beach might have some regulations about the Bank of Bank. We are, we had some, or maybe it was just the condos had their own. The condos have their own, a lot of the condos, that's, that's a whole different ball game. And the condos through their homeowner sure. association, that's a, those are agreements between private property owners. They can do it that way. I'm talking about the government here. Not, not, I want to rent my house for one night. Do you? You potentially. You? I'm not so sure. Anybody else? Who's <laughs> 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 George, do you think it has something to do with a similar technology with Airbnb and HomeAway where these folks are written out there? So it's similar to the Uber type thing, only it's for vacation. Yes, yes, yes. And here's what's happening. It hasn't happened here yet, but what's happening in some neighborhoods in South Florida, people are buying new homes like this, beautiful homes, very expensive, and they're renting them out on a, on a, on a nightly basis. And they're, and they're kids, I mean, come on, they're young. They're having parties in there every night and everything else. And, and the rest of the neighborhood is not amused. No. And, and I get that. I mean, that, that's a real problem. As a matter of fact, I think it's fair to say in all three beach communities, much of our problems when it comes to these kind of things are from non-owner-occupied buildings. Mm -hmm. we, we have, and I should have introduced him. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Endicott from Senator Aaron Bean's office. So he's done a wonderful job, and so is the mayor, explaining that the legislative process. But if you ever have any questions specifically to the Senate or the House, I'd be more than happy uh, to answer them or get the information and follow back up with you. I'll be around after the meeting and uh, I'm happy to be here. George, um, I, I read today that uh, an Obama administration official has said that if the Supreme Court rules against the Affordable Care Act, that uh, it's all going to go back to Congress and the states to resolve the issue. Is, uh, is this something that our legislature is, um, at least, do they have it on the radar in the event that happens? Well, I think they have it on the radar. I think, I think right now, though, their, their biggest problem is what are they going to do in the next, basically, week to resolve a problem that's not resolved that's really of a critical interest to the entire state and so not to crush their budget. You know, I think the philosophical dispute the state has has some logic to it. You know, on one hand, we're trying to make sure that we don't bankrupt the hospitals and give, give, give care to people that can't afford it. On the other hand, I think the other side is concerned about the affordable care act, like you mentioned, maybe going away or maybe no federal funding after three years. So I think there's legitimate arguments on both sides. I just wish that we could drop the, I just wish that we could drop the <coughs> philosophy, philosophical arguments and focus on solving problems. I think that's the biggest problem we run into in the state and federal level specialists. No one's really trying to solve problems as much as they're trying to back up their own rhetoric. And so we can either we can either fight over rhetoric and not solve problems, or we can work on a way to solve problems. This is gonna sound kind of a radical thing for me to say, but I wish there were no Republicans and no Democrats that were all, you know, we all acted as one. As somebody once told me, there's no Republican or Democrat way to pick up the garbage. There's no Democrat or Republican way to make people have appropriate health care. And I wish we all looked at it that way rather than being a letter for a person. Can you all be Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Mr. Thomas. Mm -hmm. I talk about that private Mr. Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for those of you who don't know, we've worked together for 18 years, so we know each other. And, and I would just like to add, just say, my, I would like to add that I've coached this man so many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on issues of safety, uh, I, I convinced him to start wearing a helmet when he rides his bike. Oh. Occasionally, occasionally he stops at stop signs now. And then. <laughs> but when he starts telling this story about this guy walking up to him, and getting them to go around the corner. I think, are you nuts? Bruce! Was, was, was that a he question? That was, that, <laughs> was there a question there? Was that a speech design? Just an observation. <laughs> Thank Thank you. Sorry, Mark. Right. Right. No, that's all right. <laughs> I didn't hear you mention this year, and usually in your, in your talks, what new unfunded mandate? Was there any this year? Well, you know, yes, there was, and I'm glad to point that out. The state passed a law that we very much did not support that said that we had to use the mortality tables that uh, provided by the state retirement system. 
it's my understanding that those using those retirement tables could, could cost us, but this is according to our actuary, as much as 450 million a year. So that's one that we, we very much oppose. I was able, maybe with a teeny bit of help, I tried to get the, uh, they weren't going to change it. And so I tried to get it postponed, you know. Like my idea was, well, just don't make it effective till 2030. That's not good. But they made it, they didn't make it effective 2016. So that is a concern that I have, is uh, using the mortality tables. For those who don't know what that means, we're doing for anybody who ever talked to an actuary trying to write the reports, you understand what I'm talking about. But what, it, what the mortality tables are is they they predict every employee and how long they're going to live. Yeah. So. Can you clarify that number? You said it's around 450 million total. Oh, okay, overall. Yeah. Okay. Per yeah, per year. Per year. Yes. Yeah. Per year per where? State of state. State of state. state. Okay. okay. State of state. Yeah. Okay. John, I just wanted to mention because the idea of having the updates on the website is a great idea, but it is intensive. Um, Aaron B., Janet Atkins, and Mr. Crenshaw all have updates that you can sign up for, and they'll send it to you direct. That's correct. And that's sort of for our area, and too. By the way, I want to correct something I just said. It was 450,000, not million. Okay. <laughs> 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 Okay, well you can end it up four years. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but that was for us. Right. For us. Right. Oh, okay. okay. I'm sorry, I just spoke in terms of these things. You don't have to enjoy this that much, Sandy. Okay, so no other questions. If you'd like to if you if you have if you'd like to critique or yell at anybody after the session, Charlie, right? <laughs> I gotta go. Thank you. Thank you.